thank you, all, thank you all for coming here today. Um, my apologies for giving this talk in this deep voice, but unfortunately I have a cold, so you get to enjoy the deep version of me. So, uh, <coughs> my name is, as, as, uh, as Sebastian said, my name is Pontus Stenshoff. I'm with, uh, with UCL, and I usually do work with natural language processing, but today I've had the great honor of actually doing one of my uh, favorite little side things, which is Julia. So, first of all, uh, I just want to talk about, there's this current trend uh, in, I will say, data science and science in general. So, about 10 years ago, the famous saying came around which said that essentially software eats the world. Gradually, software encompasses more and more and more industries, and I would argue that we're seeing exactly the same phenomena going on in research. Software is not just eating the world, it's also eating research. We're not, no longer seeing software just in the natural sciences, it's beginning to increasingly impact also the, uh, the social sciences as well. And thusly, uh, better analysis and automation in terms of software also leads to higher research impact. It's becoming a key part of pretty much every scientist's toolbox. So just some things where, some specific areas where I personally wouldn't have expected uh, com uh, computer science and programming actually to have such an impact. Here are some recent work. Um, for earlier this year, there was a work coming out of Stanford where they analyzed police community relations from the body camera audio uptake in Oakland. This is particularly timely right now where minorities are feeling that they're being treated differently. And this is a wonderful project where the social sciences, speech processing in order to turn the speech from the cameras into text, and then natural language processing in order to analyze how officers speak to different minorities comes together and forms, this, uh, forms research. Also earlier this, this year, we have applications of in chemistry, where instead of just going through and using human intuition in terms of which experiments to run, what they do is that they fed these, essentially these, uh, these specific chemical structures into an algorithm that then learns to rank potential experiments. And by doing so, by combining biomedicine and machine learning, they're able to prioritize and even predict science publications that come out the next year in terms of, bio in, in terms of uh, biomedicine. So given the importance of software uh, inside, of, inside of our field, I think it's also important to take a step back and look at what can we do better. And I would argue that there are several things where we could actually improve, that there are these boundaries which impede our research impact. Firstly, there is code level boundaries. The people who design the tools are seldom the people that actually use the tools. And things tend to work up until a point, and when they don't work, they actually tend to for force us to focus on things that we actually don't want to do rather than focusing on our research. Secondly, I would argue that our institutions are not necessarily set up in order to support us as researchers in order to maximize our impacts. And lastly, we as communities are fairly scattered, and we don't really talk, we don't really talk to each other particularly well. And I believe that if we can overcome these things, we can increase our research impact and make our, all of our lives better. So everyone that is involved in scientific computing usually works with a stack that looks something akin to this. Most of us in this room, I guess, work on the high-level routines where we focus on some sort of high-level programming language, say, for example, R, MATLAB, Python, where we have bindings to the routines that we want to use. And these are high-level because we want to optimize for productivity. The more experiments we can run, the better. The more hypothesis we can, we can falsify, the better. However, in order to actually get these done in a, in a comp be computationally efficient, we need them to essentially link down into low-level routines, which are then written in things like Fortran, Assembly, or CUDA or OpenCL if you're on, on the GPU side of things. And there's this wall, essentially, between these two. So, uh, and very few people are capable of crossing this wall. So an example, we just went terribly wrong all last week from my own group. We were interested in combining machine learning and information retrieval. And in order to do so, we need to have sparse matrix uh, GPU support combined with a machine learning library. And none of the existing, existing libraries actually support this. So we looked both at PyTorch, we looked at TensorFlow, and a bunch of others. And this combination simply didn't exist. Instead, the, my student was forced to learn GPU programming from scratch learn an existing code base, and he's currently working on implement, implementing all of this. So instead of just being able to run an experiment, we have to take this detour, which takes maybe a month or so, in order to actually be able to do the experiments we really want to do. And if you think, this is a fairly commonplace situation. I think many of us in this room have experienced similar things. 
where we're forced to either rewrite from scratch or learn essentially this nitty gritty little underli underlying thing in order to get our work done. Now, if you look to research in industry, they have realized to some degree, at least I would argue, that you can do this in a more sensible way. If you look at Deep, DeepMind or Facebook AI research, people tend to work together. So researchers and engineers form some sort of, some sort of closely, uh, closely related teams helping each other. They work around shared code bases. They try to focus on in-house in libraries that often also are shared with the rest of the world in frameworks. And this increases their research impact and also their talent attraction because they can essentially spot pe talented people outside in the pool that are contributing to, contributing to their code bases. So I would argue that they have succeeded with this social side of programming where people are no longer working in isolation. They're actually being able to help each other and you know who to talk to when you need help. Meanwhile, in academia, each researcher pretty much have to play a jack of all trades kind of roles. We are essentially the prototypers. We are the software developers. We are the quality insurance. And if we're lucky enough in order to actually release our stuff in order for other people to use it, we also have to take the part of being the library architect. And I don't know if you're familiar with the term, but academic software is usually used as an insult. And uh, I would argue that I wouldn't say that that's because we're poor programmers in academia. I usually see, t uh, see evidence to the contrary. But I would argue that the process that, we that we're doing in order to produce our software is essentially leading, leading to this. So lastly, and this is the third one, is that how do we bridge these communities? And here I would argue that there's something beautiful going on inside of the Euler community. The Euler community has this idea where if you're working on roughly the same thing, are, people are encouraged to collaborate. And people just do this almost naturally. I, don't, I think this is just a cultural thing. So here, for example, here's Tim Holy. Um, Tim is a neuroscientist by training. But he's also uh, contributed to, I think, how many, oh goodness me, how many libraries have he contributed to at this point? Yeah, hundreds of thousands. No, OK, maybe not hundreds of thousands, but ab about 100 at least. Uh, here for, and essentially, he's used, he has reached out to other people doing, doing similar things and uh, contributing to the libraries and giving back. Similarly, we have Jared Revels down here. Jared uh, is currently working on a thing which is called Autodiff, so aut automatic differentiation. And usually it's the case that people in numerical computing, people in machine learning, they actually work on their own little Autodiffs in different areas, but they're currently coming together, building a single tool that can actually satisfy all of, theirs, all of their needs, both if you want precision or if you want speed, you can actually pick them, but they all work together. And this is a beautiful thing. Uh, similarly, we have the Federal Aviation Administration, also contributing to Julia. They actually implemented what was it? And it was the the, airline, the air, airplane collision system, if I remember correctly, in Julia. Scary prospect, but it works really well. Similarly, Intel looked to Julia where and became a part of our community because they needed a high level a high level language where you could do multiple where you could do um, massive threading, and there simply wasn't anything on the mar on the market at the moment, and that's why they joined us. So I'm fairly optimistic. I believe that I don't know if Julia necessarily is the solution, even if, even if sometimes I, I can tout it. But I think that these specific problems, the code level boundaries, the institutional boundaries, and the community boundaries, are problems that we, as a research community, will need to address over the next couple of years. A question already. Um, I think I need to give this to you. I think it's working. I'm going to ask a dumb <laughs> opening question here. No, that's fine. What is Julia? Julia is a programming language and a community. Um, I usually emphasize the community. It will come up absolutely shortly. So this is my part, the, the high level part. And now I'll hand over to Mike. And Mike will relate this to <coughs> how things are looking in industry and how Julia essentially can play a part in this, in this game. So yeah, please take it over, Mike. Thanks very much, Pontus. So I kind of wanted to uh, kind of recap and touch on some of the things that Pontus has brought up from the kind of organizational perspective. So this is kind of the workflow, the data science pipeline that we see at many uh, industries and many companies and many like research environments, where essentially the idea is you have your researchers, they write prototype code in MATLAB, for example, then you go ahead and you rewrite in C++ and Java with your software engineers, and then you deploy and you, you know, build a package, you run on a supercomputer, whatever it is, right? Um, so this is, this is great in theory, right? But there's a problem with this, which should be obvious from the diagram, which is that we're assuming that people don't need to communicate here, right? 
we're assuming that our researchers will pump out flawless research code first try, that our software engineers won't make any mistakes in the translation, for example. And uh, you know that's all nice in theory, but if you've visited the real world, you'll know that that's not how things work, right? So in practice, even though you know this could work, it ends up looking more like this. And what happens is that we see the engineers end up having to look at the research code to try and figure out what's going on when the implementations don't match. Uh, the, the researchers end up having to read uh, C++ code that they're not familiar with in order to figure out where the bugs and things are going on, or like a spaghetti mess of Fortran code or something like that. And this thing here, the bit where you actually deploy your code and have the real world impact that you want to have, you know, the things that Pontus has talked about, ends up being way off in the distance, right? Each of these lines, each of these rewrites and communication holdups adds a month to your, your cycle. So the solution to this, I think, is fairly simple. You just want everyone to be working on a single project, right? You want everyone to work on a shared code base. Every refinement should improve the project for everyone. People should be able to share ideas uh, and benefit from each other's expertise, even when they come from very different backgrounds and are used to working in different ways. And then ideally, you take that code base and you, that project and you deploy it and you're done, right? Um, so that seems like pretty eminently reasonable, I think. The question really is why, hasn't, why haven't people done this before, right? And the answer is that it just hasn't been possible. Um, so we have a solution which we think makes this, well, this kind of workflow possible, uh, and it's going to blow your mind. It's Julia. Um, so, so what is Julia? Uh, obviously, I should introduce that for, for people in the crowd who aren't familiar with it. Julia is a programming language. And it's essentially a very simple programming language. If you're used to MATLAB or Python or R or something like that, picking up Julia will not be a problem. It's not you know, Haskell where you're learning about type classes. It's not C++ where you're dealing with pointers or anything like that. It's just simple, obvious programming you know, constructs, your normal common garden if statements and for loops and so on, right? But the difference with Julia, the really crucial thing is that we can take this code and we can compile it down to something that's really fast. So you can even take this in the REPL and say, OK, what does this come out as machine code um, or LLVM code? Now, I'm not expecting you to necessarily read this or understand what it is. But the point is that there's, we've taken this code and we've compiled it down to about 10 or so machine instructions. And machine instructions execute at the rate of you know, something like a, bit, you know, a billion a second. right? So this ends up being very fast. If you were to compare this to code, like the same code in Python, you'd end up with thousands of instructions, and it would be something that has a lot of overhead to run. So uh, this seems like a small thing, but it's actually really crucial. Um, and it has a lot of impact on the way that you write code and the way you develop. And when you don't have to like, rewrite your hot loops on, in C, that has a surprising like, impact on your overall workflow. Um, and that's meant, for example, that Julia as a community has grown very quickly because the base library is all written in Julia. People have come as contributors from academic backgrounds and implemented core functionality like subarrays in the standard library and so on, right? So we've grown very quickly, and we're now a community of you know, several hundred thousand people. Uh, we've had JuliaCon every year. Uh, this one's in London, by the way, if you're interested to come along. And JuliaCon 2018 will be in London. Um, so yeah, growing as a community. And we've had a lot of use cases and users in many different industries. Um, for example, things like the Federal Aviation Commission, as Pontus mentioned, uh, Nobel Laureate Thomas J. Sargent, uh, the New York Federal Reserve Bank, all of these people who you, in most cases, came from MATLAB uh, because they were writing code that they needed to be readable and auditable, but you know, ended up using Julia as something that they could deploy to real life uses. Um, so one case study that I think is particularly worth highlighting is the Celeste project. So this is an example of the kind of data that comes from the uh, Celeste uh, image survey, sky, Sloan Sky Survey, that the Celeste project used. And they have about 200 terabytes of images like this. And the goal with these images, essentially, is to run some machine learning on it, uh, run some variation on inference on a large graphical Bayesian model, and find out which of these objects in the sky are stars, galaxies, other things. If you can see up close here, these are actually all galaxies rather than stars in this case. So this is a huge, huge challenge, uh, it particularly so because they wanted to run this on the Cori supercomputer. And running co uh, code on a supercomputer is not an easy task. You cannot do this without going right down to the metal, doing complex transformations on your input data, uh, things like structure arrays, like classical HPC stuff. Um, you, you know, you're forced to do those things. But 
the, you know, in Julia, this is obviously possible. In fact, it's possible in a fairly small and simple Julia package, Celeste.jl. So the key thing about this is that although there are a lot of organizations involved in this project, actually only one or two people contributed from, from each organization. So there are about 10 or so people working on this. And in particular, uh, most of the people working on this were domain experts. They were astronomers. They were machine learning people, mathematicians, physicists, right? We had maybe one or two engineers, one from Julia Computing, and I think one from Intel. So that's kind of, uh, this was a huge achievement for them. Um, and it was in the running for the Gordon Bell Prize for supercomputing as well. So uh, going from kind of the other end of the scale, the biggest computers in the world to the smallest, I'll show you the Berkeley Autonomous Race Car, uh, which is this. So this little race car is, uh, is in, it has an onboard computer, a bit like a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino, uh, and that computer is running Julia. So you can take Julia and you can compile that code and you can deploy it to a tiny embedded device uh, where you know, it's doing all the computation on, on the device, right? Normally, if you were to run something like this, you'd find that you have to like, have a big BT machine over here and like, be communicating wirelessly, but you can run everything on the brain of the car. And again, this was a small team. They used the state-of-the-art optimization library uh, called Jump to do this. Um, and it just works really well. So I think they're scaling this up to a full-size model soon, and Julia will be used in, in self-driving cars. Another thing I'll highlight quickly is Aviva. So Aviva is obviously a, a commercial uh, uh, you know, use case. Um, they're one of, the, one of Europe's uh, biggest insurers. Um, and they had uh, a Solvency 2 model. So since the credit crunch and all the financial mess that we had, uh, a lot of the regulations in uh, finance have gotten a lot harder to deal with. They're a lot more computational. You have to be a lot more rigorous and run a lot more, you know, bigger models that do better forecasting, usually over your entire portfolio of assets over many, many years, right? And so this is a huge computational problem. Uh, their old system wasn't scaling up. Um, they were using IBM algorithmics, and they uh, found that, you know, so it took hours and hours to run on all that data, so they just ported it to Julia. And by porting it to Julia, it was a 1,000 times faster. Um, they actually had, were running on something like 100, or I think it was 1,000 uh, even, uh, machines on Amazon. And by porting it to Julia, they managed to reduce that like 10 uh, or 100 times, I think, um, and you know, run it 10 times quicker as well. So that was a huge win for them just by kind of moving this over. And again, this is kind of a corp this is like the corporate insurance world, but we see exactly the same processes here, right? You have actuaries, you have quants, you have these domain experts writing uh, domain-specific code in MATLAB, in C++, uh, no, sorry, not C++, in Excel, right, or in R. Um, and that has to get translated into Java. Um, but now, with Julia, that just becomes, they just write it in Julia, and then they deploy it, and it's done, right? So that's an extreme, it's an extremely uh, speedy process, and it's sped up that whole, uh, that process of like bringing their, you know, quantitative ideas to impact much more quickly. So I wanted to highlight also some of the tools that we have in the uh, Julia ecosystem for doing this kind of work. So. Uh, an example of one uh, place, so there, there are kind of a, a few places where like a PhD or a somewhat prodigious PhD student has sitting down and decided that they wanted to write a Julia package for X. And then very quickly that X becomes a state of the art in any language, just because it's so quick and easy to do this kind of stuff in Julia, right? So this is differential equations.jl, our, you know, obviously diff ODE solving ecosystem. And you can compare this to other, other platforms, other solvers, you know, Mathematica, for example, which is famously comprehensive, has just about everything, but not actually quite everything, as you can see. Um, and I, you know, obviously there's a lot of stuff going on here, but the point is there's a nice long line of green along the Julia side and a lot of red everywhere else. What's crazy about this is aside from like the, the numerical methods that are implemented, is that like the, the sheer like spread and range of this package and like where it runs and how much it can do. So you can take differential equations and you can test it with arbitrary precision floats, right? Take a flo floating point number that's 256 bits and run it with that um, and check that it's exactly numerically accurate when you're running with normal fast floats, right? Um, and that's something where, you know, if you're writing in C, you couldn't possibly do that. If you were writing in C++, you might be able to, but that's C++, it's C++, right? You could also take it and you can solve differential equations on the GPU. 
you can take derivatives of an entire like differential equation solution um, and then like do a backward pass and do parameter optimization using those derivatives. Um, and that just like none of this is actually implemented in differential equations itself as such. It just appears for free because what Julia supports, your code also supports for free, right? It just turns up. Um, you know, including things like parallelism and all that other stuff. So this is like one man year of work. This guy worked on this for a year and it's it's now at this level where it's just it just blows everything else out of the water. Um, and that's like a common story for us. Another thing I'll look at quickly is jump. So jump is a, uh, uh, a library for mathematical optimization. It gives you this DSL for, um, uh, for, for essentially expressing constrained uh, problems. So you know, what are your variables um, you know, and what are the constraints on those and figuring out some solution that maximizes you know, a cost function profit you want to make over the year or whatever it is, right? And this is, I think, the only uh, open source solver which is competitive with commercial ones. People pay tens of thousands of dollars for these things, but this one is just as good. And it will also plug into commercial solvers um, uh, for, for a backend. So, and this, although we give a very simple example, this is what's running the self-driving race car that you saw. So this kind of thing, this kind of tool is very powerful and very general. Another really nice thing, which I'll give you a demo of uh, in a moment, is CUDA native. So this kind of story extends not just to uh, to the CPU, like writing your loops on the CPU, but also to new new pieces of hardware, new targets like GPUs, right? <coughs> so if you are working with a GPU, you do not have to give up like the comforts of Julia uh, to 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 do that. Um, you can write extremely generic code. Here we're writing, you know, an ad kernel on the GPU, which will take any num kind of number we throw at it, including, you know, dual numbers, complex numbers, whatever, right? Um, and I'll show you some more examples of that in action in a moment. Uh, before I give a quick demo of that, I'll mention that uh, Sebastian is setting up a Julia interest group at the Turing. So if you want to join that, uh, grab that URL at some point um, or ask him, and I'm sure he'll tell you how to, how to sign up for it. So I'll show you a quick demo of the CUDA support that we have, because that's a nice thing to run over, if I can find it. There we go. So here's Julie's array syntax. We have an array. I may have lost my SSH connection here. isn't on, did we get his mic on? Okay, I can mention that it, it's fairly amazing how easy it is to reach into the internals of Julia, and that might not sound like a big thing, but this is one of the key things that makes it possible to, like, I have never taken compiler theory, yet I have modified the syntax of this language, um, <laughs> and, co and contributed to the core, and that's, a, that's an amazing thing. It really breaks down boundaries, and it's also a language designed particularly for the purpose of science. Mm -hmm. um, and you feel that when you're working with it. It feels like it's a language for us scientists. So yeah, Mike, please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, if that's visible. Uh, so here's uh, Julia Ray syntax. We're making an array of size. Uh, this machine is struggling. Okay, well, I'll have to talk about that for a bit then. Um, so you might be aware that uh, Julia supports um, broadcast fusion. So if you write an expression like, you know, a dot plus b dot time something, um, then it will fuse all of that into a single loop. Uh, what it will also do on the GPU is it will do the same thing. So if you write something uh, like, uh, then that all gets fused into a single kernel call. Um, and if you, you can actually take derivatives of GPU kernels uh, as well this way. 
So for example, uh, with a dual number, you just put the dual number into the GPU uh, and it, it all works, right? It works with any numeric type. So that has some really nice features, which I unfortunately can't go uh, into right now because the machine is down, but uh, yeah. So um, yeah, with that, with that said, I'll, uh, I'll take any questions and we'll kind of do a bit of a Q&A session uh, about the language generally. I can answer anything you have, uh, and Pontus as well. No problem. Um, where's the mic? Yep, there you go. It looks like it's on. Okay, cool. Hi. There we go. Um, so I'm completely bored to Julia, um, mm -hmm. but it's nice to have someone from Julia Computing here. I was wondering, so Chris Rokokas, you, you showed his uh, yeah, yeah. his his uh, package, uh, mentioned the reasons why people are not adopting Julia quite as fast as we'd like them to. And probably one of the reasons is that compared to, say, Python, uh, there are some nice libraries like Matplotlib that Julia is missing. Uh, I was wondering whether Julia Computing as a, as an entity is intends to, I don't know, play a part there and uh, put some man hours on like these key packages that are really useful for people? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's, that's obviously going to be a problem for any new language because the, the surface area for like the possible set of things you could build, plotting and web libraries and, you know, all these kinds of things. Everyone needs one of these things, right? And so the surface area is huge. Um, so that's kind of something to a large extent that happens with, with the growth of the community. And as more people join, more people are building these kinds of libraries. Um, the other option you have there is uh, things like PyCall and RCall. So Julia's interrupt with other languages is really, really good. So, so you can like basically call other packages very easily and as if they were Julia libraries. Um, so that, that helps a lot in these kind of situations. Uh, as for Julia Computing, we've kind of, so we have a lot of efforts to obviously encourage people to work on the language. So uh, we, have, we, uh, we work with like Google Summer of Code, for example. And if you're a PhD student, any of you here, which I think there might be a few of um, given the time, it's, uh, that's something you can sign up for and basically just work on a, building a package or contributing to a package uh, of your choice. So that's a good, that's a good effort. Um, Julia Computing itself works on things like, so I'm working on the machine learning libraries, for example, so I spend a lot of my time on that. And I built most of the, a lot of the GPU work, the high level like array libraries. So I think probably 50%-ish of the, the, the Julia Computing's work goes into open source basically. So yeah, there's a lot of that. Uh, hi, just, yeah, uh, just to add to what Mike said, I'm, uh, I'm Avik and I work for Julia Computing as well. Uh, most of the man hours, man hours that Julia Computing is putting into the Julia ecosystem currently is going into base Julia, code Julia, the, the uh, the compiler and the base library. And uh, so that's taking about, uh, you know, half our company is on just the code based Julia work. Uh, and we are putting in some man hours on the machine learning ecosystem as well. Uh, so we don't really have any more man hours left to put into the graphics ecosystem. Uh, but having said that, I think the graphics ecosystem is reasonably good now in the sense that at least you can use matplotlib as easy from Julia as you can from Python, right? So the entire matplotlib feature set is available to you. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people working on sort of more pure Julia options. Uh, it'll hopefully get better. We know it'll get better, but uh, from Julia Computing, I don't think we'll put in any effort into that for the next six months where our focus is Julia 1.0, right? So that, that's where most of our effort is going into, right? Thanks. My question is close related to the ones before. Mm -hmm. So I think with the large institute instituting, there's a lot of synergy opportunities here, but I was wondering the Julia community, which you mentioned, how does that community work? So, uh, so the previous questioner mentioned how manpower is maybe allocated or mm -hmm. not. So is it, is it somehow managed or is it more decentral? And how could a research institute like the Turing fit into all this? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very much decentralized. So I mean, more or less it comes down to open source uh, maintainers and uh, package authors are gonna work on packages that they want and they're gonna fill their own needs, right? 
So we have people working on web stuff because they need a web library and they're working with Julia. So it grows more organically? It's very, yeah, it's like, extreme, like any fungus, other open source. Or is it built? Or Sorry? So it grows more organically like, like a fungus or is, it, or is there also a central effort <coughs> where, you know, pieces that are known to be missing but no one wants to work on them are... Uh, like, I, I personally, I would say we're a fungus. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if, you, if, you gi if you're giving me the option. It, it tends to be that th the community is, is largely, it's largely decentralized. And we meet at, say, for example, the mailing lists. And we have local meetup, uh, local meetup organization. And as soon as, th this is one of the things when I said that we'd actually, we actually be bridge communities, is that as soon as someone finds out that someone else is working on something similar, we have this spirit that we essentially, we say, hey, I know this guy, he, he works in Turkey, he, he's in Turkey, and he works something similar to you. How about you mm -hmm. reach out and talk to him? And then people actually do this. Um, I haven't actually encountered anything where there is no support in terms of, yeah. like there's something that people really don't want to do. That yeah, is something that, that I haven't, That I mean sounds amazing, getting people to talk to each other is not an easy thing. No, right, it's, it's yeah. surprisingly difficult. And it's also surprisingly difficult to put your finger on like why this happens in the Julia community. I don't know why, and I've been well, in Well, that's, that's what I'm after. That's what I'm wondering. How does this happen? I think we're positive. Wow. That's the first <laughs> thing to happen. I mean, as someone that's hung out on the OpenBSD mailing list, we tend to be fairly friendly. I mean, uh, it, I mean it is kind so of... So that's a promise, is it? Well, th I, I can tell you the story. Okay, so maybe I should be in the video. Uh, I can so tell you the, I can tell you the story how I essentially ended up in Julia. And I, I was, I was, being, I was ha having a, a one-month uh, research visit. Okay, maybe that's a bit of an echo there. Uh, one-month research visit at Stanford. And uh, I had issues, essentially. I needed to implement what is referred to as a recursive neural tensor network, which, of course, is fancy fluff. I mean, as everyone knows, it's mostly... Uh, partial, partial derivatives and uh, the chain rule, but uh, <coughs> the uh, essentially this thing was difficult to ex to express, and I was essentially hitting the I was hitting the computational limit, so I had to write these horrible C wrappers in Python in order to get the mo all of the performance out of NumPy, and I pretty much gave up after about a few weeks because I just couldn't get this thing to thing to work, and I implemented the whole thing in uh, the whole thing in Julia and a bunch of other languages. I wasn't really considering Julia at the time. This is 2014. And uh, I couldn't really get it, get it to work. Um, but I wasn't confident in myself to actually reach out to the community. So then about, so I put it aside for about a month. Then everyone knows Hacker News, right? I mean, the, the, the source of all cynicism on the internet. Um, and I was there about a, a month later. There was this post saying that Julia is awesome, Julia is great. And I, I posted a response to that. And I said, well, yes, I, I kind of like Julia. It has this, it has this macro syntax. I can, I can really feel, feel that this is a language for me, but I can't really make this thing go fast enough in order to justify the switch. It's only two times faster than Python. And within 45 minutes, I had a patch from one of the co Julia, co from, from Julia core, <laughs> essentially saying, hey, how about you change these couple of lines here and you'll, 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 exploit, you'll exploit the CPU better. And all of a sudden, this thing was in a factor, within a factor two of C. Uh, that was the moment. Uh, that I was in, like, I, I was already a bit shy, but that was the moment when the community responded like that. That was when I really felt that I was on board. Interesting. So what's it called? Hack? Oh, don't be on hacking news. No, no, that's a source of cynicism. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Julia community in general. We we have a nice Slack channel. We also have an excellent mailing list. Um, if you want to talk to us. Yeah, I think on the kind of the, the like talking to each other point. There's a like it's worth emphasizing that within the Python community you have like a community of users and a community of developers. One knows Python, the other knows how to hack on NumPy and C++. And they're just totally different skills. And they're, you know, you talk about different things and you're, you're interested in different things. Whereas in Julia, there's just no real distinction between those two camps. Um, everyone, everyone who has used Julia has at some point poked around in the code packages and understood it because it's, it's easy to do that, right? So you have much less of that divide than exists in other languages. And yeah, we have a lot of communication channels, so there's a lot of, uh, stuff going on and people organize things and work out what to work on and how to collaborate. So it's, it's good in that way. So um, as in Python, we have a lot of data, data cleaning libraries. Mm -hmm. Are there such libraries in Julia? And the second question is, uh, what will be the focus of Turing interest group? 
uh, during Julia in first story? Uh, well, Sebastian would have to answer the second uh, question. I mean, I'm hoping Sebastian's answer is the focus will be whatever the members want the focus to be. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, data cleaning. I mean, we have some stuff, so it's still like kind kind of early-ish for like the general data frames uh, like ecosystem in Julia. Um, but we have a bunch of those packages, and they're kind of they they're getting going and like really starting to come along. So um, I think a lot of that stuff is starting to exist. Yeah, and again, like after 1.0, that will be much more of a focus and start really coming into its own. I think. Um, on the interest group, um, so I think uh, there are many people in um, Turing and also in the uh, joint venture universities who are using uh, Julia, and I just wanted to sort of uh, make a group for everybody around Turing and everybody in the U UK to basically catalyze uh, around and a bringing the community a bit closer uh, to real life than it is, it is maybe in, this in, 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 the, in the different uh, communication ch channels which are already out there and also um, to um, basically help uh, a better communication between Turing as institute and maybe the, the, the members who do use Julia to make the most um, out of bo both worlds. Yeah, we obviously always love uh, talking to people, understanding, you know, people who are using Julia, understanding what they're working on and what they need, you know, for various things. So that's always good for us as well. Yeah. Hi, uh, great talk. Uh, Julia looks like a you know, very interesting programming language. Uh, I was just wondering, you're mentioning version 1.0. Is mm -hmm. there a sort of set release date from that? The deadline for us is the end of this year. So that should be at least like 1.0 or 1.0 beta. So yeah, pretty soon, really. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. It should be mentioned that it's already fairly stable. Um, yeah. I mean, especially if you compare it to 2014 when I got in. I mean, we, we actually have automatic syntax upgrade right now through through bots, so it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, hi, I'm currently working on auto differentiation in Julia, and I saw the flex.jl package, mm -hmm. but I have some trouble running it on GPU. When I want to use cool arrays, it just says all kinds of error, like LLVM is not configured properly. Do you have okay. any idea how to solve this problem? Uh. <laughs> I'll leave that one to you. <laughs> I won't try and fix that right now, um, but I'm the right person to ask, so I'll talk to you afterwards and we'll, we'll take a look at that. And you have some more demos lined up, right? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> Hi, thanks very much indeed. Um, so I, I really want to like Julia mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that it seems, I in the sense that I have never been able to like Python and I really don't like C++. <laughs> um, and, and, and I can't persuade anyone else to use Scheme. So if I, so, you know, assuming that I get interested in Julia, and you've just heard, you know, my preferences, so what's going to delight me about Julia and what's going to be frustrating? Um, I think what will delight you, in my opinion, uh, is that it's the best list I know of. <laughs> um, it's like it's very much like it's a common list taken to the next level for me. Um, that's kind of maybe not the common opinion yeah. for everyone because most people are coming from different backgrounds. But that's that's certainly something I like about it. And so it's extremely powerful. You can use the like kind of the multiple dispatch for for very powerful DSLs. You can build macros in many languages that help you express your problem and things like that. So um, yeah, that's. That's what I like about it. What was the other question? Well, what, what am I going to find frustrating? Um, in fix syntax. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. If you like scheme. Um, I don't know. what. And things for programming in the large, sort of, yeah. you know, what's the, how is, I mean, you're at point 0.6, I guess, coming up to 1. What's the, mm. I, I don't know anything at all, but what's the module system like? How does that? work at the moment? Yeah, I mean, that's all pretty good. Um, we have some more things that we want to do around things like interfaces for types and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's pretty workable. Like if you're, you know, if you're a Lisp programmer, you can be disciplined enough to write good code that scales up well. And the language kind of encourages you down a reasonable path to doing that. I wouldn't like to throw a thousand Java programmers at project on it, but it's, it's good enough, I think. Thank you. Um, how uh, I'm using HPC clusters at university, 
How easy, because I had a problem getting um, some machine learning um, software installed on the cluster. Basically, don't mm. install it. Yeah, get you, you and everyone else on a university mm. cluster. Yes, yeah. so we, we, um, we've all been here. Uh, how <coughs> likely or easy will it be to get Julia sort of set up and running um, on a HPC or some oh, GPL cluster? Oh, HPCL or which university? Oh yeah. Sussex. So Sussex. Okay, can't speak for clusters. your cluster then. But yeah. Um, I, I find it trivial to deploy on anything that supports, li supports Linux, even on horrible old CentOS installations. Um, it just works out of the box. I, it's fairly amazing, actually. Um, I have never had issues with HPC compiling it on the other matter, but then again, I mean, the, you, need a mo you need a modern compiler, and if you have CentOS with a compiler from 2009, that ain't gonna fly, but, <laughs> but you can just lift in the binaries and it works. Hi, uh, yeah, so I was wondering, um, Python is, first of all, uh, Julia's stuff looks really, really cool. Um, the Python, though, one advantage it has is not just that it has lots of libraries, but it has lots of tutorials. So yeah. if you're kind of pretty, like, naive when it comes to programming, like myself, it's kind of useful. You can just go online, and someone's probably written somewhere a blog post about how to do something quite complicated in Python, and you can kind of just follow along. Is there a lot of educational and kind of training material out there for Julia? Yeah, there are a few things out there. So, for example, I mean, I think it's, it's maybe you have to like it look in a bit more of a directed way than just like throw something to Google and it works. So we're kind of at that stage where it's growing, but not quite mm. as big as Python, obviously. Um, so things like David Sanders' video tutorials on the uh, on the Learning Julia Lang page, um, they're really good and they're like well recommended by most people. Um, and like things like Stack Overflow usage is growing, so I think we get a few questions a day now, something like that. So that's like gradually picking up. Um, again, like still not at the Python level, but not, not too bad, not too bad. I think, I, I think uh, you might have to do a little bit of human interaction. Yeah. Um, for better or for worse. Uh, I would actually argue that for the better. We are small enough still where you can pretty much reach out personally to anyone within the community and get a response. So if you join, say, mm. for example, wh what's, your, what's your primary research interest? Uh, it's not actually network learning. Okay, so you're machine learning. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, if you... If you, for example, join the machine the machine learning channel, you'll be able to talk to pretty much everyone that has designed the frameworks that you're using mm -hmm. uh, directly. And it's I remember in 2014 when I had this slide and I said like it's a young language, and a lot of people said, well, that's a bad thing. Well, there's a good thing as well. You can talk direct you can talk directly to people. They're not swamped mm -hmm. by having 150,000 industry people trying to get uh, to do them them to do the job for them. They are interested in hearing what you are doing and what you're getting wrong and they most likely would accept even patches if you want to have better documentation. Yes, yeah, so I mean, you can go on the Julia forum, you can go on the Slack, like Pontus mentioned, and they're all really responsive. You'll get quick answers and things. So that's a good way uh, to do it. I wouldn't necessarily throw someone into that if they've never done any programming before, but as someone who like has a little bit of experience, you should mm -hmm. have a good path to learning it. Go ahead. Hi. Yeah, thanks very much. And it's nice to hear about a language which has, you know, scientists that it's, mm. um, well, it's interested in reaching out to scientists. But I have a question more about um, performance. So you mentioned that you're within two times of C, mm -hmm. I guess, for serial programs and so on. But if you're yeah. looking at shared memory parallel programming, what kind of differences can we see now? I notice that there are some features in Julia which mm -hmm. seem to allow it. Yeah, so uh, we have threading support. It's extremely experimental. Um, so that's kind of a beta feature that you can use. Um, I think performance is pretty good for that. I haven't really tried it so much myself, but I think, again, it's like 2x of C is the right ballpark. And generally, people obviously take this very seriously. So if you're like, if you say on the mailing list, I can't, I can't get good performance on this, they'll generally treat that as a bug um, and fix it. So, okay. um, but that's, we kind of run out of those problems for like normal serial code, as you said. So that's not, yeah. Okay, thanks. I mean, a key, a key difference in terms of design is that performance, I mean, I would argue performance is not an afterthought mm -hmm. in Julia. Mm -hmm. Rather, we are aware that performance is important. It's not like Python or any of the, any of the other high, li high languages, which they're good. I mean, I, the interfaces are nice, but usually performance comes second, right? I mean, first you get the interface and mm -hmm. dynamic programming. Um, Julia is fast, always for pretty much all of the code that you can, Im that you can imagine. I have uh, to give a personal story again, we made uh, in 2015, was it? No, 2014, uh, we implemented a, a, deep mo a deep model in Julia, purely CPU based. 
and one of my uh, former colleagues at Cambridge re-implemented re it in TensorFlow recently. And he was like, okay, no, all right, all right, it's GPU now, TensorFlow, I'm gonna blow this garbage out of the water. Um, turned out that his, his GPU code was ten, 10 times slower than the, uh, the Julia 0.4 mm -hmm. code, I think, like that we, we brought, I brought together with a student back in 2014. Um, don't worry, like performance should not be a concern and threading is properly supported, I think, at this point. Am uh, I correct in that? It's still a bit experimental. It's, it's, it's possible okay, to yeah, use yeah. it. Like it's, it's, yeah. it's possible also to break yeah. it. I, I've done that. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't use it unless you like know some threading already. Like if yeah, no, but as a person that knows threading, it yeah, yeah. It's was sufficient for mm. me at least to get my work done. Mm. What, what about uh, coroutines? Are there plans for? Yeah, we have coroutines already, so they've been in the language for a long time, and channels as well. Mm. So you can do Go-style cooperative multitasking. Um, and the plan eventually is to have a Go-like or Silk-like threading model on top of that, so you'll be able to spawn off tasks and they'll automatically use all cores. That's a, some way off, but like that's a post 1.0 thing. That's going to be a high priority, I think. We had already briefly talked about that every person ever that wanted to run Julia on a Super Mutant had issues. Uh, but in sort of more generally, <coughs> what what would you recommend? How 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 do you pitch um, Julia sort of to the powers that be that sort of make decisions about where what what languages are used for software and that kind of thing? What what uh, what's your recommendation there? Um, so I guess uh, talking about some of like the the organizational processes I've mentioned is a is a good start. Um, but also, obviously, like a lot of the time when people are solving this stuff, it kind of comes from below. So you know, they'll s they want to see a good result. If you show them, oh, I implemented this thing, and you know, it's it it's really fast, and I did it in a day, then that's kind of a good like that's evidence-based stuff to show people. Um, but also, it depends on the person, right? Some people like the case studies, and they like seeing the corporate users and the logos, and yeah, two different things. Hello, <coughs> I saw your, uh, I quite enjoyed that little car uh, using a, uh, some embedded processor or another. So yep. how many target architectures can you, can you put this on? Um, so we do at least um, x86 and ARM. Um, and power, yeah. Mm. Uh, is that all? Yeah, okay. They're, they're the three we support basically. So I mean in general, in theory at least, we'll go anywhere that LLVM will go. So as LLVM has support for more things, then we kind of end up targeting those things eventually. Yeah. So I just have a quick question about uh, the scalability. Mm -hmm. um, so to give you a quick use case of, in it, I commonly work in data sets where we're, we do the basic modeling and prototyping in R. Mm -hmm. And then, so that'll be with a tens of thousands of rows or so. And then, but at the moment we want to deploy, it might be over a billion rows, say. Right. And so recently, one of my collaborators, <coughs> collaborators was saying, okay, you've got to try Julia, you've got to try Julia. And mm -hmm. I tried it. And, but then I wasn't quite sure how to proceed from there um, in terms of, for example, loading things into memory out of core capabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could say a bit more about that. Sure, I'll, I'll add a bit to that. So the, probably the best option for that right now is JuliaDB, uh, which I'll, I'll show you. So JuliaDB is our kind of uh, distributed processing database. Um, which works out of core, it works on a cluster. You basically load data up like it's a data frame kind of thing. And it will um, run on a cluster and like and kind of actually send the Julia code to all the works in the cluster in almost a Spark-like way. And uh, that scales well, and we've tried that with many terabyte data sets and things, so. So it's kind of like containerized or something? Or uh, not quite. Yeah, kind of. Avic might want to say a bit more about that. Yeah, uh, so JuliaDB itself is uh, not containerized, but it runs on top of uh, what we call Julia Run, which is a containerized version of Julia that uh, works with Kubernetes and uh, uh, you know works on the cloud, uh, all that. Uh, but uh, JuliaDB itself is just a pure Julia process that you know can run on your local machine on multiple cores, for example, or can run sort of on raw machines, bare machines. Uh, so uh, the the database itself is you know can run on any can run on 
any location where Julia runs, uh, be it containerized or not. But we have a separate layer that you know can containerize Julia itself. So it's all layered, and you can choose which layer to run, uh, uh, and based on you know your hardware requirements. Uh, so uh, the JuliaDB query language is uh, sort of a functional query language. So you have like filter, map, aggregate functions that take you know other functions that are then run on the data. So we may have a sort of SQL-like query language on top at some point, but right now the query language is as I said just functions taking other functions to run on data. Right? That's that's the API, which which lets you do everything you want to do. Uh, but you need to think in terms of functions to run the queries. Yeah. Uh, the derivative of x squared, which is um, obviously 2x, so 2, 4, 6. Uh, we can also define uh, something like this. A sigmoid function and apply that. So now we've basically just passed your numbers into the sigmoid function and we get a derivative of that function without any other effort. We just throw it in and it works. So, and this also will work on the GPU. Um, and also it will, because of the way broadcasting in Julia works, this compiles down to a single loop which just executes this uh, in one pass. So. Can I ask a bunch of questions? Yep, go for it. So the, the sigma hash definition is, mm -hmm. is just synonymous with function definition. Yeah, that's right. So that's just a short form of it, which comes up quite a lot because it's a mathematical uh, language. Thank you. And the period after mm -hmm. dual or mm -hmm. after sigma, is that syntax or? Yeah, that means map essentially. So if you're familiar with the uh -huh. highest broadcasting syntax, it's like that. So I can do, for example, uh, and get the addition of those two things or this, and it will copy the columns right. along each time, if that makes sense. That's very handy, but it's probably a bit confusing the first time you see it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, essentially, essentially it's map, so that's a map okay. with two arguments. Okay, that's it. got it. And so yeah, that's a handy way to do this, but I could equally have said map uh, and you get the same yeah, result. Okay. <laughs> that makes more sense to me. Okay. The, the, the dot syntax is built in, is it? That's not a Yeah, so the nice thing about this is I don't actually have to write this function definition. I can do this. Uh, and that says each of these operations is mapped. But then Julia can see that you have these like four maps, and normally that would create however many temporaries, but this will all compile down into one loop. Nice. And the same on the GPU. So this actually, if you if X is a, is a GPU array, which looks exactly the same, it's not really any different, then it will actually compile a single CUDA kernel and run that on the GPU. And so what's nice about this as well is that because these kinds of computations tend to be memory bound rather than compute bound, uh, the derivative is actually free. It takes exactly the same amount of time to get the derivative as and and the value of the function as well as like as as if you were just doing the function on its own, if that makes sense. So this, this has no cost whatsoever. Um, so yeah, and this is this uh, dual number trick is essentially impossible to do in any other language because you can't define your own value types, your own numbers. Uh, it's kind of doable in C++, but then you have horrible templating everywhere and the library has to set up to take those numbers. Whereas as you can see, uh, all Julia code is just generic by default. We don't have to say this thing is generic. It just takes anything because that's what we've said it does. So can you interrogate the system about the, uh, the type dual? So for example, is it a mm -hmm. subtype of something? Where does it fit in the whole? Yeah, so I can, for example, uh, in June I can do this. Um, and this will show me the same array, but I can basically jump in and rather than printing as a number, it will show me the values of the struct. So I can see that the f it has a dot value field which stores that and a dot partials field which stores some tuple of derivatives. Uh, and equally, so I mean to make that clearer, 
x1 is a dual, the value is that, the partials is this. Um, the other thing I can do is I can say uh, field names, which gets me roughly the th same thing. You see what's going on? I can say super type. It's a, you know, it's a type of real number. It behaves as a real number. I can also do things like uh, methods. So take the GCD function and jump in and say what's going on with this function, what does it do? So mathematical functions obviously tend to be very polymorphic. So if you have like multiply, for example, multiply can take two real numbers or it can take complex numbers or it can take matrices or you know, vectors or other tensors and these all do slightly different things. So if you look at times then you'll, you'll see that going on right, right in the system. Try that again. Yeah, there, there are a lot of methods for this function, so it might, might take a moment to render it. It's usually a bit faster. So yeah, 185 methods, right? So there's, then there's like, you know, FFT stuff in there going on and things like that. But you never have to think about that, right? You just multiply things together. Um, and if we do GCD, we can jump straight into the base library. Let's see here uh, and see what's going on there. We can even jump in. Wait, you just opened up. Yeah, so this is a file inside Base Julia. So I can just jump straight in and see the source code. And of course, most of the language is written in Julia. So we can like inspect everything that's going on and see how things are working. Go ahead. Let's jump in really quick. Can I just jump in really quick? So I can hear a lot of people asking about what ID this is. Is it Atom with a plugin? Because it looks yeah, like a really right. great way of getting started. So yeah, um, this is Juno, which is, and it comes as a, we bundle this as Julia Pros on the Julia Computing website. You can just grab okay. one bundle, or or you can you know install Atom and then install the plugins. Either way yep. it works. But it looks super friendly, which is great. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice way to get going. I think and see what's going on in your code and things like that. He's the he's the creator of the ID, but it's a wonderful ID, and I'm not not afraid. Uh, maybe you could say a few things about sort of the GitHub integration of Julia and how you can sort of inline patch things. Sorry? Maybe you could say a few things about sort of how easy it is to interact with the package manager and how you can sort of check out and submit patches and these kind of things. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I mean, uh, I'll, just, I'll just finish up this. So um, basically, uh, the other thing Juno can do is if you eval inside like a module or a package, it will uh, update that definition uh, and inside like the running Julia process. So if I change GCD and then eval, you can see I've you know it's registered that, and then um, when I uh, when I call GCD again, it's now showing some state, right? So this is a useful debugging tool sometimes. Uh, show a V or something, right? And so we can see what's going on. Um, and there's a real debugger as well and things, but that's kind of those things are kind of useful. And so if you're modifying a package, that can lead to like a very nice fast feedback loop for making changes and things. Normally to to make a change to base, you'd have to spend like five minutes recompiling everything, but this just makes that process instant. Um, yeah, the other thing was the package manager. So that's that's extremely easy. You can do uh, package.add uh, and you're done, basically. All packages are Git repos, so if you want to go in and make a change, then you can make that change, submit a PR, and you're a contributor, right? It's that easy. So it's uh, that's really nice. So for example, I can just jump into uh, What's a good package? Uh, Autograd. So now I've opened up the Autograd package and I can see what's going on, make changes, and submit PR just straight away, right? That's, that's a nice way to get into this kind of stuff. Any other questions? Go ahead. Sorry, I'm just going to ask a question again. Go for it. Someone can just shut up. Really so good. the type system, mm -hmm. which is dynamic, yeah. can you say a bit about it? So, for example, are functions types, how far does it go? Uh, um, so we don't have like classical like arrow types of functions. Um, they do have their own types, but it's more of an implementation detail. Um, what we 
So the type system is, uh, it's dynamic, but it's actually unusual in that it's a, it's, there's no static checking, but there is, it's parametrically typed. And this is pretty key because you have to know that an array is an array of integers in order to store it compactly as like a contiguous memory, right? Um, if you didn't have that, you have like something like Python where everything has to be a pointer or a box all the time. So that's like a, a key part of uh, Julie's performance. And you can dispatch very flexibly on various like combinations of, you know, is this a wrapper around this and, and that kind of thing. So, so just to show, dispatch can, is can, you can you show them what, what dispatch means? Because I think most, most people, sure, mo yeah, most people in there probably don't understand what dispatch, what dispatch means. They, they're usually not concerned about So for about example, So essentially what's happened here is that we've defined two methods for this function. Um, we've defined like a general method which always works, but we've also defined a special method which comes up when you have, when you pass it an integer. And this is very similar to like if you're from a classical object-oriented language, you do like object dot method, right? And that's polymorphic. It behaves differently depending on what the object is. This is similar but far more general because uh, in this, you can overload like any combination of things. So <coughs> it's particularly important, as I said, like the multiplication. You want to overload matrix times vector differently from vector times matrix or vector times vector. Um, and you want to be able to overload things like, um, uh, say, x type of real times y as type of vector. And that should do something particular, right? So if you've ever looked inside NumPy, NumPy has a horrible set of hacks in order to enable stuff like this. And Python generally has a lot of like machinery around doing this. But in Julia, that's just a native thing that it does. It can, you can specify things like this. And uh, it, it, looks like, it looks like a very, really small thing. But this is actually is precisely what enables you to use other people's libraries very, very easily and mm -hmm. just hook into them. You don't they don't necessarily need to know about your specific <coughs> inheritance structure or whatever. It's just works easily out, easily out of the box and allows people to just borrow borrow yeah. functions. Um, I think we're running a little bit over. Um, yeah, but so I guess like one definitely like one more question. And of course, I think Mike and I will be around um, yeah, I afterwards mean, well if you, if you want to talk to us and mm. any like any level of question is perfectly fine. We've been talking quite complicated deep questions about the language uh, for mm. a little while. Hi, so I wanted to ask uh, when you do a package add yeah. Is that pulling a package off the internet? Yeah, that's And if right. so, uh, what kind of protections do you have in terms of making sure that only legitimate packages get put into the repository? I'm mentioning things like there was an attack on PyPy mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a couple of months ago where some people substituted Trojan PyPy packages that were kind of typo squatted yeah, yeah. on um, popular packages. Is there anything like that? So our we have a centralized um, package registry um, called methodated.jl. Um, which is where all of the listings for all registered packages go. And if you add from there, then it's like guaranteed because it's all going through Git and GitHub anyway, so it's all their security. And uh, we obviously see all of the registrations that go through. So it's not like uh, NPM, for example, where anyone just registers the package and you can see that. So we've never had any issues like that and we're not really expecting to. Um, yeah, a simple answer. All right, so yeah, there's tea and coffee over here, so grab something from there, and we'll, we'll hang around for a bit and answer any uh, more questions. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you.